Hello, hello. Hey, Leonard. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Everything okay? Everything is great. Excellent. I hope it's not going to rain. Well, if you're inside, it doesn't matter. Well, I have to go outside to get home. <laughs> okay. So, um, I'm just waiting for Iris and then we'll try out your slides. Make sure that uh, you can share the screen. Yeah. I think I'll get my headphones in case I have an echo. Yeah. Hello. Hey, Yasha. I'm not hearing you, uh, Yasha. Say something. Hey. hey. That's good. Perfect. So I'll just get Iris as well. Okay. Then we can check a few things. It's early in the morning for you, Yasha. Are you a morning person? Yeah, I get up every morning at about five o'clock, 5.30, oh, the latest. Sounds but I go to bed by eight. Sounds terrible. Mm -mm. Yeah, not my style. I love it. Yep, Nobody's up, nobody is out and about, nobody's yeah. bothering me, no phone calls, no nothing peeps, yeah. nothing takes yeah. it start. I, I believe you, I believe you, but still, it's not uh, how my body works. <laughs> Um, okay, no Iris. Uh, Leonard, uh, could you try to show your slides? Let me just check that first of all. I think I need, just need to give you permission. Uh, all panelists, uh, all panelists. Okay, you should now be able to show your slides, Leonard. Perfect. Okay, we have it. Yeah, so let's take that off now and then. Uh... <coughs> okay, so we're ready. I'm just waiting for Iris. <clears throat> okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Jenny, could you try using that link? I think Iris has the wrong link. What is it? What is it? Is it giving you that message? It's making me register. So I just now it's hiding the profile. By whom? It's quick to join. Yeah. Um, and please wait. The webinar will begin soon. I don't see you. Did everybody have a good weekend? I broke my toe. Okay. Oh, no. Good weekend. Yeah. So I, I was thinking, it was the funniest story. I got up in the middle of the night. I swear to you, I was thinking I was in my house in Berlin. And I, was, <laughs> I walked straight into the wall and my big toe broke. There you go. So I had to go to the doctor and I hit this like, and I'm experiencing uh, the first um 
Yeah, the actual, what it means to have a trace core, which is called now in New York City, mm -hmm. that will trace you and see and follow you. Hey, here is. Yes, to see if uh, I'm sitting there. with uh, Lena and uh, Yasha here. I don't see, you're not, I, I don't, you're not here. I don't have a chance to approve you. Uh, you register as a normal participant. Okay, that's it. The same with Jenny. Okay, fine. In that case, that's the answer. Jenny also has the same message that it starts at two. So uh, then at two o'clock, um, um, I hope that everybody will suddenly appear on screen. Well, that's good. Um, and uh, everything is fine with Leonard's slides. We just checked that. Yasha is good, except she broke her toe. So I'm not going to ask her to walk anywhere. Yeah, good. Okay, well, at two o'clock, we'll, yeah, see you then. Okay, bye. So, Yash, I'm sorry about your toe. Guess, guess where I was this last weekend? Berlin. Berlin. I was in Berlin, yeah. So, um, because uh, from the Netherlands, you can't travel everywhere, but Germany's okay at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and Jenny had points at Soho House, so we stayed there for a few days. Okay. The weather was perfect. So we did well. We know Berlin quite well. We went cycling around Potsdam. Good. Uh, That's uh, nice. We went canoeing in the Spreewald. Uh, so we had a we had a holiday four days. It was great. Good. Uh, Just in time before the next closure. Yay. Exactly. No, you're right. That's what's happening. The the Germans no. are worried. The well, that's what happens with the UK and with your oh. north up north in Manchester is quite different. It is. It is. And here is getting bad as well. Especially when you're from the north of Holland or the south of the, the regions, North Holland and South Holland, you're also advised not to travel. Yeah, I know. I saw that. We, we traveled just before they announced it, so we're okay. Rebel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I also broke my toe a few years ago, but it was only my little toe, so it, you know, it was very... I, wouldn't, I couldn't care less. I think I broke my little toe when I was a, yeah. a dancer a hundred times, but I broke my big toe That's and difficult. I can't walk and the balance is off and I have a huge band-aid on it and a yeah. thing now and I'm just like, ish. And I have to travel to Tennessee, one of the most infected states on Monday. You're looking forward to it. Sorry, am I looking forward to it? Yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to the exhibition. It's a breast cancer charity exhibition. It's 20 years that we're celebrating. It's going to be a weird experience because only 20 people can go in the room for a, you know, estimated of 1,000, 1,500 a day visitor experience. So that's going to be interesting. But do I really look forward to go to Tennessee? No, because when I come back, I'll have to go into this newly opposed, uh, everybody in New York State has to go under trace, um, trace core quarantine. And they call you every day and they follow your GPS and they know when you left your house and then they call you right away again and they come to your house. Huh? Like when you're a prisoner. Yeah, it's a little bit like, you know, it's a little bit like um, Brave New World or Animal Farm. It's like, I, feel, I don't know which one it's going to be, but so it's, the future is upon us violently and i love how we just use the pandemic to exercise how far can we actually go with diminishing democracy and democratic rights love it you mean making it explicit because nobody has come up with something which hasn't already been working so I, oh yeah but i think also the, the rights that have been deducted from our list of free people in such a short amount of time they are quite quite enormous and I guarantee it I would put money on it as fast as they were taking they won't come back as fast if at all so that's interesting oh, it's interesting to have someone knock on your door with two people with a pass and going like oh hi hi so do you live alone you're like yeah do you, do you mind if I come in and see I do but it's mandatory okay and you know we put you in a hotel if you can't be alone Huh? It's even worse than when you're on parole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I understand that people have to stay in quarantine, but if we're at the point where we do not believe in our uh, fellow human anymore, that they're, you know, at least 50% of our fellow humans have enough brain to understand that this is the right thing to do, then I don't know. I don't know. I believe in humanity. 
the problem is you're not going to prevent people from not doing what they're not supposed to do with it. So there is no... I personally think that you're right. I think it has a complete adverse effect because if you know this will happen to you, why would you register? You have to reply to a text message, which yeah. is apparently also mandatory. So if you know now this will happen, people that feel infringed on their rights, they won't do that. So that means we have a dark number everywhere. And when that dark number, do you think those people are going to go and call the state when they feel sick, knowing that they'll be transported to a hotel room alone? No. So, yeah. It's, in, it's the last bastion before November, so let's see what happens. Jenny says she's, Jenny is coming back here. Uh, Leonard, you haven't met Jenny, I don't think. She's my wife, she's from New York. Ah, okay. Yasha knows her from, well, a couple of different ways. And um, yeah, Jenny's going back to New York in 10 days, but she's coming here for the election, just in case there's a civil war. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm gonna, I've, I have thought about it too. I'm like, what will happen in November? My flight leaves on December 19th. But it's, uh, if it, I, it's a great possibility, um, especially in the flyover states, that this is gonna cause a huge uh, an eruption of epic proportion yep. and with the with the weapon laws and uh you know this wild west attitude what we could be facing is an is an enormous catastrophe and I'm, I'm, it's so fragile right now i think i don't think people realize how fragile for the people living actually in atlanta in memphis in tennessee texas georgia ohio how it's actually for them Always, my, my girlfriend is a travel blogger, and one of the things we wanted to do always was like a road trip in the US. And now I'm even doubting to actually even, if it's open at some point, even go to New York, because I'm just like... Uh, New York is the safest state out of all of them because we're under that much control at the moment. But where we, where we I mean, it's going to be so interesting to go to Tennessee now because Tennessee is like, ah, no. So... We'll see, but New York is safe, you know? It's, it's not safe in the Bronx. The Bronx returns to... It's just the whole things going on in America. I'm like, yeah, I just, I'm not sure if I will need to travel there. Well, all I can tell you is if you do travel, then be prepared to get into a 14-day full-blown-out quarantine with surveillance. You're being broadcast to everybody, is that right? Yeah. Okay, I think we've got some attendees joining. Okay, that's good. Yeah, some attendees are joining us now. Okay. But not everybody yet. So we shouldn't swear anymore. I know, no well, I, it's Dutch. they're Dutch, they don't care. I, well, I can come up with some swear words. <laughs> I okay. miss the Netherlands. I was, I'm supposed to work in uh, Rotterdam again for the double the... I can't say it. There's a really beautiful building, the Double de Bloom something. It's a gorgeous old building. It's the only old building. It's a museum right now, a pinball museum. Pinball. And, okay. Yeah, beautiful museum, and they want to restructure it. So I can't wait to be in the Netherlands again. It's all yeah, over I mean, the, now. But. The Netherlands, I mean, occasionally I think the Netherlands is a little dull, but that means it's very safe and nobody has guns in the streets. So I'm very grateful for that right now. <laughs> it's not dull at all. I'm working with Paul Spies, who used to run the, the museums in Amsterdam, and I've worked with your mayor in Rotterdam and with your minister for culture. I have never had more fun meetings than in Rotterdam or in Amsterdam, even cool. though the two don't get along. But Well, actually, that's a very good introduction for you to make, uh, especially as most of our participants are now joining. So mm -hmm. you're, you're now everybody's favorite speaker, Yasha. Congratulations. Oh, good God. No. <laughs> No, I'm no. But I, love, I love Amsterdam and I love the Netherlands. That's what I, it's all I can say. Good. Well, that's great. Uh, yeah, I know Paul Spies. Uh, I also visited in Berlin, but haven't seen him for a while. He has a huge job there with the Humboldt uh, Center. Yeah, I'm one of his curators. So I curated the avant-garde section. I curated the entry hall. So we'll open on January 14th. So I've been working with Paul for uh, three years now. Okay. And uh, he's probably one of the most innovative uh, museums directors I've had the pleasure to right. work with and curate for again 
he, he, certainly, had a, he certainly had a good reputation here before he left. He's amazing. Yeah. Very good, very good guy. Okay, well, it's now exactly two o'clock and I think we have uh, most of our uh, participants already registered. So I think enough of the chat between us, we can carry this on later. Um, and I'm going to do a, a general introduction. Uh, first, welcome to everybody who's joining. We will stick to only 90 minutes, that was the promise. Uh, so Yasha and Leonard are both instructed to really get their key points out. Um, and then we will have time for questions and your own comments. Uh, we you will use the Q&A feature. Uh, you should be able to access that without any problem, but uh, of course, please let us know if there's any, any difficulty there. Um, uh, the, um, I'm going to give you a little personal background to why we're doing this. Um, and I've been living now in the Netherlands for almost six years, but working here for more like 15. Previously, I lived in Spain and before that, the United Kingdom. I used to come here and work with my clients and then fly out again. Now I'm doing the reverse. Uh, and I've never regretted moving to Amsterdam, wonderful city, but also it means I've got more engaged with the cultural sector here, work for some wonderful organizations and some in other countries, but mainly in the Netherlands now because I'm living here. Um, it has not been without its frustrations, and I may talk about those frustrations later. Um, but of course, like everybody else for the last six months, uh, seven months, it's been a very depressing time, really, really difficult. Um, uh, partly for, for what the work I do, but more importantly, it's been very difficult for many of my friends and many of my professional colleagues. Some have lost their jobs. Organizations which I admire, which I know well, are really struggling and some I think will close. Um, and so I've been wondering what I could do. Uh, and the answer was nothing. And that's not a situation I like to be in. Uh, it means that I can't uh, help them in their difficulties. And it makes me feel a little useless. And I, I don't like that. Uh, because in the short term, uh, really, the only thing that's needed is money. Uh, and the only people who can really provide that short term income are, is the government, national government, local government. And they have done that. Not enough, I think, but money has come from, uh, from government bodies to enable cultural organizations to keep their doors open, to enable them to keep some staff. And there's also general business money that they can access as well. Uh, but I started wondering what was going to happen next, uh, because the short term only happens for a while, and then the short term quickly becomes the medium term, and the medium term becomes the long term, and that's a fast process. And now I realized that actually there are things I can do because the work I do is to work with cultural organizations, usually at quite senior level, to make long-term strategic changes in the way they organize themselves. Okay, so now perhaps uh, there is something I can do. I and my colleagues specialize in this area. And these seminars are one way of us to focus attention on the long-term for the cultural sector everywhere, but particularly in the Netherlands. The worst scenario, I think, is that many cultural organizations survive, but they never really flourish again, that they keep the doors open, but at a reduced capacity, that they've had to let go so many of their staff and abandon so many of their, their plans that even though the lights are on, there's nothing really much going on, limping along. Because survival is not enough. It just isn't enough. Our organizations are very important. Uh, uh, they're very important artistically, they're very important to their communities, they're very important to so many professionals, artists and arts administrators. Our organizations are incredibly important and it isn't enough just to survive. We have to really think about what's going, what we have to do long term uh, to, to flourish dynamically. That is not something the government will help us to do. Uh, governments too need to think about the way they're funding cultural organizations and how they will help cultural organizations to make a transition. Uh, but they haven't yet reached that point. The fourth seminar in our series is talking about the role of local government, particularly in helping cultural organizations to make transition. So survival is not enough. Uh, the, the, and the whole series of seminars, six seminars this autumn, are called Beyond Survival for that reason. The question is, what will happen in 2021, in 2022? Uh, once we've seen what's happening with vaccines, with uh, changes in uh, government policy and so on. Uh, I realized when considering the problems facing our sector, our organizations, my friends uh, for the next few years, 
is that many of the problems have been around for a long time already. The whole COVID-19 crisis has been a real shock for the system, but like shocks do, they have exposed problems that were there already. And I'm talking about things like lack of community engagement, lack of diversity and inclusion, uh, a real deficit in understanding the digital economy. Really, cultural organizations everywhere, particularly the Netherlands, are a long way behind. Uh, I'm talking about diversifying income streams. I'm talking about changes to governance, uh, particularly at the level of the Rad van Zuzicht, uh, and, uh, and, and the high level committees that really should be reaching out and helping to bring support to these organizations. All of these things have been around for quite a long time and the cultural sector in the Netherlands has actually frankly not paid enough attention. Everybody knows these problems exist. Some people pay lip service, very little has been done. It's a little late now to start, but unless we grapple these issues, then in the future, we won't be able to flourish as and deliver our missions. Uh, I'm going to give you um, a couple of quotes now, which will illustrate this seminar and also perhaps the future. First, it is not that this is a quote from Charles Darwin. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the most responsive to change. And that's what the agenda is for the whole seminar series. How can we change? How can we adapt in order to become stronger organizations in response to outside stimuli, in response to this outside shock? I'm gonna give you another quote and then explain how it's relevant to this series. And this is from Albert Einstein, another name I hope you're familiar with. Um, problems cannot be solved by thinking within the framework in which the problems were created. And this leads us to the awkward conclusion that all the experience of the people who run our cultural organizations, the directors, the heads of department, the members of the boards, all of that experience is only slightly useful because we are going to live soon in a very different world. So that experience is essential because that uh, knowledge of these organizations and the sector generally in Dutch society is very important, but it is not enough. We can really only uh, change ourselves, only transform ourselves in the ways that each organization finds necessary if we bring in outside opinions, outside ideas, outside people indeed. People are not normally associated with the cultural sector. There have been several uh, online conferences recently which are looking at some of the online issues. I know that Jacqueline Cronchon and Roy Kramers are both participating in this session. And they've launched a very interesting initiative, uh, an online seminar last week and a very hard hitting open letter to uh, Het Parole, the newspaper, which I agreed with completely. So other people are thinking about this too. Um, but uh, one problem I see is that most of these seminars, most of these online conferences, most of the comments in newspapers uh, and the media are really involving what I might call the usual suspects. Well, great, their opinions are very interesting. But this seminar series, 12 speakers in total, involves people who are unusual suspects. That is people who have a, 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 some experience in the cultural sector, um, but not directly in managing cultural organizations, uh, certainly not traditional cultural organizations. These are people with different experiences, uh, often in different sectors of business, banking, business uh, more generally, uh, people from different countries, and certainly a whole range of people with different personal stories and different uh, uh, ethnic backgrounds. That's absolutely deliberate. Uh, I hope you will find very few people speaking of these seminars that you recognize. That's the whole idea. Now, I'm probably the oldest and most traditional speaker. So I'm going to stop talking now and hand over to Yasha and Leonard. Uh, we're starting with uh, Yasha. And I'm just going to read just a little of um, her introduction. And Yasha, if you want to add something else or correct me, please do. Uh, yeah, so Yasha is the founder, concept creator, and executive director of Urban Nation, the worldwide first museum for urban contemporary art in Berlin. Uh, and you stopped working there in 2019, I think. Um, partner and co-founder for the 4M, which is the Museum for Contemporary Culture in New York City. And Yasha is joining us now from New York. Uh, happily, she likes the mornings, so that's okay because it's pretty early there. Uh, she's senior executive and creator with 25 years international project production experience, including the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, MoMA Italy, United Nations, Foreign Ministry Germany. There's a long list. It'll take me longer to read it out than for Yasha's presentation, so I'm stopping there. 
Um, but you can see that her experience is, is very ex extensive in different countries and really a lot of unusual kinds of cultural organization. She's known as an international speaker and she's now studying at Harvard uh, about new trends and concepts for uh, cultural institutions. Um, Yasha, I'm going to stop now. The floor is yours for 15 to 20 minutes and then uh, we'll, we'll have a segue to Leonard. All right, well, thank you so very much, A, for inviting me. Um, welcome everyone who's here and B, for making me feel like I've achieved something in life. And that's, I'm very humble, but thank you so much for summarizing my, my work so beautifully. Um, I was listening to when you started uh, the conversation and it's funny because when I go into telling you a little bit about my story, it has a lot to do with what you mentioned. And that just goes to show how important these issues are and how many people are simultaneously thinking of it. I would like to do this a little bit like a story. Um, I came back to my home in Brooklyn, New York to build a new museum and that was last November. I was researching in Harvard for my thesis. I was writing about new innovative museum structures and exhibition planning for the 21st century museum, about the digital changes institutions had made or did not make since 2010. And I also joined the ongoing discussion about ICOM. ICOM, that is the International Council of Museums. Um, and I joined the discussion about their efforts to come up with a new definition of what the museum of the future should be. So I know it's a lot of theory, but let's just talk about the definition for a second. And then as we move forward, keep in mind this exhibition, uh, this, this definition, if you can. So the old definition of what a museum is and should be was a museum is a nonprofit, permanent institution in the service of society and its development. It is open to public, which acquires, conserves, research, communicate, and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity, its environment for the purposes of education, study, and enjoyment. That already is a mouthful. So now let's go to the proposed new definition. Museums are democratizing, inclusive and polyphonic spaces for critical dialogue about the past and the future, acknowledging and addressing the conflict and challenges of the present. They hold artifacts and specimens in trust for society. They safeguard diverse memories for future generations and guarantee equal rights and equal access to heritage for all people. Museums are not for profit. They are participatory and transparent and work in active partnership with and for diverse communities to collect, preserve, research, interpret, exhibit, and enhance understandings of what the world, of the world aiming to contribute to human dignity and social justice, global equality, and planetary well-being. So all of this is supposed to be done by a museum. And by the way, later on realized that joy in education went right out of the window in this new definition. So of course, this suggestion was vehemently rejected by the council and still is not final years later and is the cause for a deep rupture in the museum community. Feel also free to ask me about this later. Full stop, March 2020 came. And then with it came COVID-19. My production of the museum came to an abrupt halt immediately. Um, stock market has tanked, um, Harvard's closed its door and went virtual, and there simply was no such thing as going back to normal or a new normal. There was just now, and the news, and daily reports of death, and new measures of human tragedy, as we were trying to self save ourselves from an invisible, unknown, resilient, and smart, and ever-changing attacker. So exactly at that moment in time, when the virus was at a height and, and I was in New York, uh, David asked me to participate in a webinar and he asked me to wrap my head around questions he sent me. And for me, one of the first questions was the most crucial one. How do we now identify the essence of our work? Well, what is the first thing you need to know when it comes to your essence? What, are you, what you are made of? You do DNA. Though the term company DNA is used to describe an organization's cultural and, and, and culture and strategy. It's a metaf metaphor for what makes it unique. And understanding your institution's DNA can help you know what you can, but more importantly, what you cannot do 
and how to ch achieve agility, how to remain relevant and authentic in this interrupted world. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, um, basically what this new situation with COVID has created, and David just said it, was not only a huge urgency, like, and a new urgency for all topics, but it was forcing us to pick up speed and act, innovate and create our new identities ASAP. The main question was no longer what are museums, but what are we now, like right now, in the immediate now, and all the new realities we are dealing with. Museums closures would have been unthinkable six months ago. The American Association of Museums predicts that a third of all museums will close doors for good. Staff layoffs are final. Only 50% of all staff may return, and in some cases, even less. Funding is pulled. State funding here wildly not available. The sale of artwork out of museums collections to private people to fund your um, operations, your day-to-day -day operations, um, and your staff was prohibited and severely frowned upon. But it is now a necessary means to survival. And by being forced to close our doors, and this is probably the most important thing, we, are talk deprived, we were talk deprived of what kept us alive, our main stakeholders, those that matter most and whom we serve, the public. Well, now what? If we can't serve our audience and we can't create the experiences we want to provide, what are we and why are we here? And yeah, oops, dare I ask it, are we still relevant? So at first, museums, community, and institutions were incredibly hesitant with transferring to online because who would then go back to those big expensive spaces and architectural marvels and buildings if everything would go online? And if we digitalize collections and experience, what about the in-person experience? And again, most importantly, who are these new audience that we connect with now online? It's almost like online dating and you can't go Tinder because they're all here and they all have something to say. Well, indeed, we have to focus on additional audiences we might not have taken into consideration as a majority before the virus. People who are bored, adrift, in search of self-enrichment, people who are lonely and are probably in massive existential crisis, people who are feeling inadequate as educators for their kids, people who need relief from anxiety and trauma, people who experience grief from the loss of normalcy or the loss of a loved one. And then there was the question about workspace. Now we have these new audiences and where would we meet them? New spaces of interactions. We all agree online is not enough, but we didn't know how long we were gonna be closed and where would we reopen? So working outside the institution and those halls of fame and, and glamor or just these big spaces after spending decades arguing that the outdoor space is second best for any institution seemed hypocritical. Outreach, pro outreach programs were severely frowned upon. And yet now the public space was the only space for the institution to connect with the public and to survive. And as a side note, the genre I work in, street art, was actually one of the main reasons who set a day, set an example. The only art that could continue to function outside, leave a social commentary, spread hope, connect people on an unprecedented level was street art. The work that my creative community has done with art in the streets during COVID is unbelievable. Additionally, during the riots across the country in the wake of George Floyd's atrocious and unnecessary death, it was urban contemporary art who helped spread the word, lift the spirit and the morale, and also demanded justice. So in fact, when we really think of everything now, six plus months into it all, does it not become clear that we are facing a trifecta pandemic? COVID-19, a moral debate, and a global financial, financial crisis. And really, we as museums, where are we relevant, relevant in all of this? And how do we deal with the new circumstances? So to me, turning towards each other, acting outward in the face of unprecedented challenges, instead of the, you know, the more human common path of turning inward, trying to preserve what is there, what I know in a desperate attempt to hold on doesn't work. Outward is the only way to deal with the fundamental and existential questions for all institutions serving the public moving forward. 
Over the last decades, we discussed inclusion and participation and cross-genre collaboration. But the institutions that I worked with, you know, institutions that were not that, in the beginning, the big institutions, they shied away from opening up too much. They didn't want to share space and knowledge. But the institutions I had the pleasure to work with to restructure, reform, and digitalize, and those that had already began reshaping the DNA of their teams with new expert, new digital options and experience way before COVID-19 had now unknowingly prepared the soil from which a much needed and expected change could grow. Museums that had the, added the virtual layer to their exhibitions or institutions online presence, for example, had much less costly and faster ways to remain seen and heard and offer support during the lockdown and temporary closures. So you may not know this, but, or you may, I don't know, but for us, the new hashtags and crowd and community funded campaigns unheard of before dominated the virtual space in the first months of COVID. The flexibility of institutions that had already focused their work to incorporate social media aspects proved that exactly that approach provided the resilience needed to navigate the struggles ahead. Hashtag campaigns and challenges like Museum from Home, Museum Moment of Zen, the Getty Museum Challenge acted as catalysts and umbrellas for institutions to bond and also to realize, hey, my followers, my audience are now my followers and these followers or friends or audience, they become our innovators. They're their micro curators, opinion leaders, and they help us ultimately to understand who we were now to them and what would be expected from us through comments, et cetera, et cetera, and through participation. And the institutions listened and acted and all that without an ICOM definition in place. We are collaboration, uh, collaborating and exchanging programs and sharing and transferring knowledge for free and most of all publicly. We have generated access and knowledge and education for everyone if you had internet, by the way, a whole other topic. Participation across the board and for all generations, a community within the field, free learning and beyond. We started supporting healthcare issues. We partnered with local organization. We offered our spaces up for food kitchens and established mental health and trauma support groups with art therapists. And we wanted to be vital participants of the future. So the pre-COVID-19 ongoing and mostly action-less debate on what we are and who we should be and all that drama about searching a new definition had suddenly found an unexpected, unfortunate, an unprecedented ally, a pandemic. The new interim, the new normal, as we sentimentally call it, with all its inventions and ideas set in as a quick fix and a band-aid. So we baked and then we tie-dyed and we danced and we zoomed the living hell out of each other. But let's look at these temporary patches and their long-term effects. Can the digital and virtual band-aids we have developed simply be ripped off and the wounds will heal? Or must we indeed think of this time in history as a holistic transformation, as a detox process for our particular industry and humanity, and as the world keeps looking for a cure or a vaccine for the virus? And yet even if there should be such a cure, human behavior may remain changed forever. Reluctant visitors may not return to participate in large scale events. Donors will rethink their commitments in the face of ongoing financial crisis. Museums will close and artwork and pieces of memory will be lost forever. Education will be a struggle. And yet, I think we have to look at all of this as an accelerator for transformation. There are amazing possibilities and opportunities for actual change and progress if we are tough on ourselves. If we let go of all the past, all we have, like we're holding on to and get in sync with the change, must we not be able to create something brilliant, something evolved, so we can actually be cultural guardians of the future, which is what we claim to be. So with an open heart and open eyes, I started thinking of options for change. What new incentives may be developed and offered to donors in collaboration with stat, state tax officials, tax laws? How can and must we reform our educational program to be inclusive also, inclusive also for haptic learner? Not everybody loves the internet or can, internet or can handle Zoom uh, learning. 
What if large state-owned and funded institutions had to give 1% of their annual funding to a grassroots institution and every year a different one? What if we implemented jobs such as online community managers, trauma and empathy experts, childcare specialists, outreach officers, dual language educators, immigration and family law lawyers, career advisors as a mandatory permanent staff in a museum? We'll get well, we can discuss how we pay for them. What if additionally, if it was mandatory for university and other degree programs to work with their local institutions on developing a co-learning program? Can we remember and go back to our roots and turn away of what we have too often seem to become a, an untouchable temple of elite knowledge reserved to only a few, but instead, why don't we just go back and serve as an extension of our community? Again, against common practice, I do not want to end on a high note for today, as I think we all should be really worried and ask uncomfortable questions to understand and feel the urgency, grow motivation and empathy and act now. Questions like this one. And what if all of it was futile and we failed in rescuing the creative industry? What would a world without museums or art institutions look and feel like? How does humanity exist without content, visible, tangible, touchable, sensible, without our collective memory that we can experience in person that will tell our story and the story of the world, past, present, and future? And the conclusion to me must be, we can't, we don't, and I will do my part that we certainly won't. Thank you very much. Can't hear you. There we go. Dangers of Zoom. Uh, thanks, Yasha. I mean, um, first of all, now I, I remember exactly why it is I invited you to speak. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm also very grateful to the people at Zoom for allowing you to join from New York City uh, without the cost of the airfare or the environmental damage uh, of a plane journey. So this is just wonderful. Uh, and uh, uh, although I miss meeting people in person, this is uh, a great way to stay in touch and to hear views from all over the world. Um, you give me a big problem because my job here as host is to sort of make a nice segue between you and Leonard and pick out a few key points that may become uh, a topic for discussion when we open it up to everybody in a little while. Uh, but there are so many of them that I have a whole list of points. I'm just going to pick out one or two. Um, I hope others have, uh, have made their own notes. Um, uh, the, the thing I like most was the idea that outward is the only way forward. Now that, you'll find that topic also reflected in some of the other seminars uh, which, uh, which we're organizing later. Um, and it, this is a criticism I personally had and had voiced it previously is that cultural organizations in many countries, and I've worked in Spain, Germany, Austria, uh, here in the Netherlands, but let's talk about the Netherlands. Cultural organizations in many countries do not really understand themselves as extensions of their communities. Most of their funding or a very a large part of their funding comes from local and national government. Uh, and essentially, they are focused uh, on doing the best they can with that money that comes to them from above, uh, which is a, a very important job. But the idea that they're an extension of their communities and that a very important role they have is to really engage in many different ways with their communities is not, I think, uh, adequately taken, uh, taken account of. And this is reflected in very practical things like being able to earn more money by using intellectual property in terms of earning money from donors. Um, and during the COVID pandemic, it's obvious that organizations in the United States and the United Kingdom have done much more for their communities than has happened here in the Netherlands. Uh, that's a, a strong criticism, but I'll say that and have examples of that, which I can share for those that are interested. Now, um, you've come to a, a very crucial question, which I'll raise again after uh, we've heard from Leonard, uh, which is the basic question of what is a cultural organization for? Why on earth are we here? Um, uh, uh, and uh, we'll come back to that. Leonard may address it as well. Uh, one thing I'm very clear about is that we must end these seminars on a very practical note. There is no point just having an academic, academic discussion. I've been participating, in fact, in academic discussions um, with uh, academic organizations around Europe. Very interesting, but they never end with practical things about, okay, what can we do now? We're going to do that. And one of the reasons I invited Leonard to speak is that's precisely what he and his, 
his organization do. Uh, Leonard is partner in Aim for the Moon, uh, which is a startup studio that helps corporates and other organizations build a better future. Uh, and he is engaged in the cultural sector in the Netherlands, as he'll talk about. More than 15 years experience in running uh, corporate ventures, being responsible for the innovation lab of the largest media company in the Netherlands. And over the past four years, helping large corporates, and I know also now some cultural organizations, build new businesses and transform their businesses at startup speed. So I'm now going to hand over to Leonard. Thank you, David. And uh, thank you for Yasha for paving the way that you have set the bar very high. I'm uh, really happy to be here. And um, yeah, maybe a short introduction about me because it does give some context uh, besides what David has told about what I'm going to tell. So what we do is we help these big companies actually uh, create new realities, uh, innovate, build new businesses and find growth. And what's interesting when we do that, we always tell them, look outside of your business, look outside of your market. And one of the things I often tell my customers is actually look at arts and culture, because to me, art and the cultural sector is like the first station where things actually get set or where agendas are set. So um, I, I had a quote from somebody who said, once it has been uh, imagined, it will happen. And that's what I see as the role of the cultural sector. And what always puzzled me and still puzzles me is that a sector that has so much creativity and so much potential that I actually use to innovate um, big corporates um, really, really is struggling on uh, innovating themselves. So I'm really happy that you invited me, David, and that at least I can share some of the experiences and insights that we have on changing corporates, which hopefully helps people or the attendees at least to think of how they can change and how they should change in a different way. And when we talk about that change, there's all this big stuff happening in the world. We have COVID, we have uh, Black Lives Matter, we've got hunger. So it always is very daunting on how you can change. And actually as a company, we have started an initiative called United Impact, where we said, okay, we can look at all these individual small things that need to change in the world, but let's look at how, in this case, corporate leaders, change makers, uh, other rebels, look at the big challenges that we have in the world. Uh, so we interviewed about three, surveyed about 300 CEOs uh, and change makers, and then analyzed what are the shifts that have to be made to actually make the world as we want it to be. And what's, what I want to do with you uh, today is actually take some of the, the shifts and actually some of the dilemmas and um, uh, yeah, or, or underlying dilemmas, uh, share them with you and how I see that translate to the cultural sector. Uh, of course, I will have a presentation as I'm the business guy. Um, and then also share my ideas on what you could actually do and how these, uh, how you can make it practical because one of the hard, hardest things of these big challenges is you can just talk about them and then everything you discuss is very true, but unless you get into action, you cannot change anything. Nothing has changed by PowerPoint, except PowerPoint itself maybe. So uh, on that note, I am going to share with you a PowerPoint presentation, which is of course then, uh, okay. So, the process that we use or it's called the perfect world principle. So the idea behind it is that we try to ask people, how do you want the world to look like? What are examples of what the world should look like? And then why didn't it happen uh, tomorrow? So um, I'm not going to go into the process uh, that, that deeply, but it's very important because these three simple questions actually identify the, um, uh, the frictions and underlying limiting beliefs, so the dilemmas and underlying limiting beliefs that actually stop the world from changing, if it's a market or a market segment. And what's interesting about it, instead of trying to just build the perfect world and have that, that, that picture of what you thought of, when you understand the dilemmas and underlying limiting beliefs, you can actually innovate tomorrow because you can start innovating on changing those limiting beliefs. 
And when those limiting beliefs are gone, you can then actually create uh, uh, the bedrock to create that perfect world. So what I'm going to start is share some of the general dilemmas and how I see these are become relevant for the cultural sector and then discuss a bit uh, about, yeah, what, what can you do? What can you do tomorrow? And one of the things you can definitely do is um, uh, together with, uh, with Bram, who David knows, we actually want to ask the cultural sector to share actually answers to the three questions that I've, uh, uh, I've shared. So I will send a, a link afterwards because what we want to do with the cultural sector is see which dilemmas can we really take a deep dive in and change together uh, and change so that we create a new system and not, uh, as you already said, David, a system which solves problems with new problems, because that's what happens when you try to solve um, a problem within the context that it was created. You just create new problems. Just to give an example, I was just discussing uh, CO2 emissions uh, with somebody and then they said, yeah, then the government has higher um, uh, changes the norm and then a boat doesn't go to the, uh, Rotterdam Harbor, but they go to the Antwerp Harbor. That's an example of change of solving problems with new problems because this is, it's, it's not solving anything. So um, the dynamics of a perfect world for the cultural sector. Let me just uh, do the presentation mode. So I think, so just an, another part of the introduction, the dilemmas will be either on leadership. So what's the thought leadership that you have to have to actually change something? The other ones will be on uh, organization. So how do you organize it? Business model, which I think is very relevant for the cultural sector. And also, how do you communicate? Uh, yeah, how do you communicate what you're doing? So what do you throw out there into the market? And one an important leadership dilemma is react to control versus trust to create. And I think when you translate that to the cultural sector, react to control is about, okay, I have this budget, I have this money, this is what I'm doing, and how am I going to keep that? I'm going to keep it in the same way that I'm used to having it. Where if you look trust to create, it's really focused on, okay, um, things are going to change, we have to change, and we are so ambitious in getting there that we trust that what we're going to come up with is going to be valuable for me. What it does have in it is that it could in the short term feel like it's so different or it takes away a lot of the comfort that you have. And what you see, what we also see with a lot of uh, companies, if you really look closely at what we're doing for most of the projects, we are actually going to cannibalize the market of the company that we're working for. And if you look at that on a, on a short term level, then why is there a reason for doing that? But if you look at it at the long term, it's going to happen anyway, and the system needs to change. That actually opens up your mind to really, really start creating uh, for, for the future. And if you look at the COVID situation and all the cultural, uh, uh, or a lot of um, uh, museum and, 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 and other parts of the cultural sector, a very important reflex was, okay, how am I going to keep what I have? Because the world is going to change and I'm not going to get what I have. And I think, Yasha, you gave a very interesting insight that, yeah, if you take these temporary uh, patches and actually accept them as, hey, this is an insight in how it's going to be and work from that, then you're trusting to create versus reacting to keep what you had. Um, another one, which is specifically, I think, in Holland is very relevant. We have a strong rule for less rules and regulation. Everybody wants to be free. But when shit hits the fan, am I allowed to swear a bit? Uh, there's a demand for strong ruling, which I find very interesting in, uh, in, the, in the cultural sector, but you also see it in the private sector. So everybody wants to be a businessman. Uh, Donald Trump uh, also shouts, yeah, business, business, business. But at the end, they look for government, for government funding to, to be bailed out. And I think that's also very interesting uh, um, when you look at the cultural sector. It is so intertwined with, uh, with rules and regulations 
where it's a sector where actually people create new rules and new regulations. So how do you actually shift from a sector that is yeah, in, in its business model and in its value model is, is put together by a lot of rules, regulations, and how do you actually change uh, and become more independent and less dependent on, on, on what happens uh, outside? Um, and the other one which is really, really apparent is on how it's organized. So uh, it's silo accountability. So being accountable for the part of the world that somebody gave you the responsibility for. Um, if you look at it on a business level, uh, when I'm talking about silo accountability, it means when I am in transport and I have trucks, I just look at the CO2 emissions of the trucks uh, that I have, change them into electric trucks, and then I'm doing well. The question is, am I changing the world when I'm transporting uh, vegetables which have been flown in by a plane, which were raised in some kind of greenhouse? Am I really changing the impact of my CO2 footprint? And uh, the dilemma is that you have silo accountability, but actually what you need to be looking for is organizing, um, uh, organizing for uh, as one swarm for impact. So really uniting to make sure that in this case, the cultural sector stays relevant, that it finds its new value proposition. And what, what I see in, in, in the projects that we've done for the cultural sector, we've actually done a project where we had different, uh, 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 different players in the sector work together to work on uh, solving problems for the sector. And at the end of the day, they're just trying to solve their own problem to survive to tomorrow, which again goes back to uh, uh, react to create. It's really about getting away from this silo accountability. We all find this sector very important. So why is it so hard to make that happen? And again, if you want to innovate, then we also have to start innovating on making sure that we can organize as a swarm for impact versus we take all this silo accountability and we all, we all work on the same thing. Everybody has been working on the same ways of solving ticketing. Why don't you just solve that together? Because then you can work uh, uh, together. And what I find very interesting in the cultural sector, there is, there is no commercial competition. Everybody is then there in there with the best intentions, but somehow because of the model, and which of course has to do with the business model, uh, it becomes uh, very siloed and that translates directly into the business model. Uh, I win competition to everybody wins and collaboration. And uh, a very small example I heard, I was in Carré theater and then yeah, they could not do all their plays, but they had some smaller theaters uh, that could not actually have enough people to watch the play. So why don't you use that space for those, uh, uh, those plays? It's a very small example. But uh, I think it's very important to realize if you want to survive, uh, I'm not sure, especially in a sector that's so, so important to, uh, uh, to the industry, to, uh, to people's well-being, that you should compete. And okay, how can you change the model? How can you change the business model that is not a business model of competition, but it's uh, a business model for, uh, for co collaboration. And I think this one uh, is especially in, in, in business, we make these uh, business plans for 12 months and we have strategic plans for five years. I don't think any plan had a global pandemic. So, uh, and what you know with also the speed of innovation, the speed of change in the world is that you can wonder if like these four year budgeting plans for uh, cultural institutions really, really make sense. So planning for a so-called reality versus facing real time unpredictability. And what's really interesting, if you take all these dilemmas together, they also hold each other in place because I just want to uh, protect what I have. I want to make sure that my institution survives. So I make the greatest plan in the world which at the end of the day, the plan becomes more important than the role that you have in society, the value that um, you have to create. And I think 
I think you, you mentioned that uh, Yasha is by changing the value proposition of what you are in a cultural, as a cultural world institution, it actually opens up a lot more possibilities of collaborating, of coming up with these new business models. And I think if there's one sector that has the ability to come up with these ideas, it's the cultural sector because there are all these creative people who can actually come up with um, uh, with these new ways of solving problems. And I, I actually interviewed um, uh, an artist who's made his art building businesses. So actually when he has a creative idea, he thinks about how do I actually uh, launch this as a business? So I, uh, he, uh, I think he launched, uh, uh, I think he launched the brand, a uh, brand around uh, Mohammed. Um, he, he has a boat where um, uh, refugees actually take you around, boat refugees take you around the canals in Amsterdam. It is a cultural statement. But what's interesting, now that boat is actually making money and is actually helping these refugees uh, uh, survive uh, here. So I, I think there's so many examples where the creativity from the sector can be very, very effective in coming up with new ways. And I think sometimes the sector underestimates the potential that it has to actually help businesses. So on one hand, you have a sector that's looking for business models and that's looking for ways of, of, of inspiring people. On the other hand, my business, there's a whole private sector that is struggling to come up with even okay ideas of what their future should look like. If you don't see yourself just as a museum, but also as a change agent or as a window into the world of what's going to come, uniting those two worlds, you can actually come up with, with great stuff and you can have a business model on art, which in itself doesn't need to be sold because it's actually the story of what art is telling there. But this is also still very high over. The way we actually approach these innovations is by making them very practical and making them very small. So if you really want to change that, um, uh, that new business model, there's no point in um, debating about it and having 25 people uh, at the table and coming up with the most fantastic creative model. The idea is how you can approach it is really dreaming big and starting small, making sure that you really under, understand the different parts to that model and then start doing experiments. And that's exactly the same way as, for instance, a painter works. You know, he doesn't just create a painting. You have all these sketches and all these tryouts and then you come to that final painting. And I think that part of, of the entrepreneurial, uh, that part of creativity which you find very much in the products that the market make is what I think is sometimes missing in the entrepreneurship of, the, of, of, of these businesses or of these institutions. Because I think they are very well, uh, were very well equipped to it and should start being open of really, really thinking about what's the value proposition? What's the stuff that I leave behind in the world? If you're a company, we look at the value proposition, you look at how do we make money out of it. But when we look at the business model of, of the businesses we create, we also look at how can this model survive uh, beyond the first year that we just invested in it. And I think that's also very important if you look, for instance, at the business models within um, the cultural sector. Look, it's not government funding is not bad, but government funding cannot be a business model alone. If you use it as a model to kickstart something which then can live on on its own, uh, the same way we look at development money, uh, we're not just donating to build schools and then have schools built by donating uh, money. You know, we're actually educating people to build schools. We're educating teachers to be in the schools. And I think that's a big shift that, uh, that, that the sector needs to make. And it can, it can learn a lot from uh, startups, but also keep in mind that don't make yourself too small because I think there's already more capacity than in, uh, in the regular business world uh, to, uh, to make uh, these changes. So I am totally convinced that we can make these changes, uh, but I really think that we should really work together, find these new business models and 
change the platform on which culture is built instead of trying to change more platforms or making them more efficient. I think the culture in itself is, is one platform. So uh, this was my rant or talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Leonard. Um, again, I have far more notes than I have uh, time to um, uh, 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 bring them out. So I'm going to rely in a moment on uh, the other people attending, on the, on the attenders. I see one question, um, which I'll come to in one second. Um, uh, but I'm going to really hope now that the people participating, the people who've just heard what uh, Leonard and Yasha, you've said to us, have uh, points that they want clarified, have points of disagreement, which would be wonderful. Disagreement is very creative. Um, or have some examples also from their own work or things that they've seen in the in the Netherlands recently. Um, a couple of points I will pick out, um, uh, which, uh, well, to be honest, my experience uh, um, echoes this, uh, points that you made, Leonard, is that cultural organizations seem particularly to struggle with innovating themselves. And I think it must be, in the end, partly to do with the nature of the, the funding structure. Um, and uh, they indeed, uh, in many cases, I think we could all recognize, whether we think it's good or bad, that cultural organizations are very institutionalized. Uh, and there is a danger, of course, if this happens, that the institution becomes more important than their original purpose. And that's why we started this whole series with some of the core questions of DNA and purpose and value. Um, before I throw the floor open and uh, uh, relay the question I've already had, um, three things you raised just now, Leonard, uh, will come up in future seminars. One is the nature of the value that we have to our societies, to our communities. Uh, that's coming up in throughout, I think, uh, all of the seminars, but in particular in a session on impact um, uh, measurement, identification and measurement of impact, how it's possible to do that. More fundamentally, it's a question of who are we valuable to and what value do they see in what we, we do? Yasha, you talked about the way that some of the new people uh, engaging with cultural organizations through the internet, the value they find in our organizations is actually really quite different to anything we've seen before or anything we even thought possible. And the value they see in us is also value and we should welcome it and identify it and work with it. Uh, the role of funders uh, in, a trans in transformation in a period of transition is actually going to be very different from the role of funders uh, when things are moving along as they have done in previous years. And one of our seminars in November will talk about the role of local government in particular. Uh, and then engagement has come through uh, in a broad sense with our communities online and offline, geographically located, uh, communities of interest. This has come up several times in everything that Yasha and Leonard have said. And, um, uh, it specifically, we'll talk about that in uh, the sixth seminar series in December. But actually, again, it will come through everything because you cannot really talk about the future of the sector without talking about the values we have to different people. And if you're talking about different people, then the question is, how do they see us and how are we engaged with them? I'm going to stop now and I'm going to throw the floor out. We have a couple of people um, here and this is uh, from uh, Jacqueline. I'm simply going to read the question and then I'll invite Yasha or Leonard uh, if you just want to uh, engage with that. Um, uh, just shouts and the first one that shouts will get to answer first. Uh, Jacqueline says, I agree the cultural sector has much to offer. Uh, we should also acknowledge that art is often without direct purpose. That's a good point. Certain art forms are suitable as an entrepreneurial concept and some are not. So uh, can we uh, reflect on which disciplines in the art world are more appropriate to gener generate possibilities in the business world? Um, I don't know, Leonard, do you want to start with that one? Uh, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm always an optimist. So I don't think there, I think that's, that, that's part of a limitation. I think, I think the, the question behind that is, should you only make art for that business model? And yes, you should definitely not make art for that business model, but when I, when I look at, for instance, a, a museum curator, they curate for art in a museum and they actually make that translation to the visitor. You could actually also create, curate all forms of art to how can this be relevant for a business? It could be paintings that show um, a, a, a vision of, of a world to be, but it can also be very practical. We worked with um, a theater company 
that actually used drones and a lot of technology uh, within their company. And a model for them would be actually to have technology companies sponsor them so that they actually use that technology in a setting which is experimental for that technology company. It actually displays how it works, but it also creates business value because um, the, the theater itself is an, experiment, is an experimentation of using uh, that technology. So I, I, I don't think that the artist should be uh, uh, right away think about the business model, but there should be people within the, uh, its um, uh, peripheries that actually help on how does this, uh, uh, this translate. But I think one of the limiting beliefs is that art as uh, just being uh, 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 without direct person purpose, sorry, cannot have a business model. I, 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 if we would innovate, I would love to find how could we make that work? Because if we make that work, it means we can still make the art we want, but we're not dependent on, uh, on the funding structure that we have now. Yasha, do you want to say something? Your, uh, no. There you go. I want to say all sorts of things, but uh, I, I, I agree and disagree, but there's one thing that struck me. Um, first of all, I agree with the fact that we should look to art uh, when we shape new things, because I think art has one amazing ability, which is we are not confined, but what can actually be done because we think what we want to achieve, how we get there is not important. But that brings me to my second point. I do not believe um, that artists need to try and sketch and sketch and try and that there needs to be a plan. I don't believe in that. I think a lot of times we work in structuring, especially in museums, so structured with so much plan, with so much guideline. We spend years developing the guideline instead of spending you know, time on just doing. And it sounds so futile and maybe too simple, but it is actually, if applied, massively interesting. Um, it was one of the biggest challenges for the Humboldt Forum when you have four museums in one house and everybody wants to get their stuff and everybody wants to do it right. They, everybody thinks about the plans and guidelines on how to change things or how to move things forward. Nobody actually does. Sometimes I take the sketching process away from artists. Sometimes I invite them to be in the wilderness and wildness of the pure creation and then let's talk about the outcome and then let's see and declinate down what the outcome can, you know, how can the outcome be applied on something new? That's, um, that's what I think uh, of, that, of that one particular topic. Okay, thank you. I'm going to, uh, I hope people will respond also to these, uh, these answers, these, these contributions. Uh, and I have another question I'm going to ask in just one second or relay. Um, my own personal uh, note on that question that Jacqueline asked is that cultural organizations have many different purposes. Um, uh, some cultural organizations involved in the making of art, the creating of art, although surprisingly few. A cultural organization is not an artist. There are some exceptions to that, uh, but most of our cultural organizations are not actually directly engaged in the creation of art. They are engaged often, particularly those with physical um, objects in conservation and research. These are fundamental purposes which, uh, which uh, uh, don't necessarily directly have a business, an external business model. Um, but they're, almost all cultural organizations, almost all, are involved in interpretation for uh, the citizens, the public, however you want to define that, education specifically when it comes to younger people, and in particular, presentation. So those are some of the many purposes. Beyond that, and this is, I think, where, where creativity is needed, uh, because they are publicly funded institutions, often with very large, interesting spaces, uh, with a, a footprint in their cities and, uh, and rural areas, that they have a purpose in their communities uh, for which they're not explicitly funded, but which is nevertheless really important. What this all means, this multiplicity of purposes, is there is no single business plan which will fit every cultural institution, not at all. Uh, their purposes are different, their values are different, the people to whom they are valuable are very different. And the whole point of the process of innovation and uh, honesty and uh, comprehensive, uh, a comprehensive analysis of what we do 
is that we can identify our purposes adequately. And that's why we started with this topic right now. Yes, but I, also, I also think we're speaking about European institutions a lot here sure. because a lot of American institutions are not funded by the state. This is sure. a major issue. So there is no security sure. and the, the essence of change of something and to do something and to be innovative and creative is a lot more, has a lot greater urgency. And that's also something that's interesting because going back to ICOM, what Leonard said is so true you know, change and do something about it and think of yourself outside the box and think as a swarm and, you know, can't do that if you have an organization like ICOM put a fucking cheese bowl over you and tells you, you can do whatever you want, but you can't do it unless you fulfill this and 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 this. So by the time they have tried to fulfill everything that's expected of them to be, they, there's not much left to be innovative. There's, there's just no space. And, you know, a lot of people, I know someone was wondering about that, is a lot of people are extremely conservative. I think we will have to start addressing all these big things that we want to change by dealing with the fact that change is scary all the time. It's scary. We don't like it. We're not meant to like it. We don't want it. So we have to work, like you said, Leonard, on much different levels really high up to change policy and really down here to connect and figure and, and explain that this isn't scary, this is needed and this is the benefits or this is the path. And that's my last point. The path really, again, must be the way. The path is more important than the plan. Thanks. Yeah. I'm going to turn now oh, quickly. Yeah, yeah, because I think that's that's also the whole idea of the dilemma that you want to to plan when you know that planning now you know you need to have an idea where you start go somewhere. I think somebody gave an example of driving in in the fog. You know where you're going. You know where you want to go. You have an idea where you're going to go. But what happens and what comes across to you on the road? That's what you uh, you need to deal with. And that's I think and 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 I think another thing if you want to be creative. I always say, look at another market. For instance, the example you gave that in America, it's totally different. For Europe, it's already interesting to look there. But I would then challenge, how could we look at a market where it would be so impossible to create art and how are artists creating art there and how does that work? And how can you translate that to your own situation? Because it actually is an example of how things can work. And uh, we all think we're very clever. We come up with these great ideas, but I, know that every idea has already been thought of, but it's just been thought of somewhere else. Okay, um, thanks for that. Now I'm going to move on to another question that's just been uh, put on the Q&A. Just to tell uh, everybody participating and encourage you to use the Q&A function, should be at the bottom of your screen, and you can simply type in a question, uh, and I'll, one of my jobs is to pick out those that uh, seem relevant. Uh, I hope we have so many we won't get to them all. The first of these now, Aha, excellent. Um, more questions coming in. That's good. Please keep them up. And by the way, after this session is finished, FSI, I and my colleagues, will actually try to uh, address some of these questions so the debate does not finish. We also, of course, have more seminars coming up. But I'm going now to the next question that was asked, uh, or a point, I should say. This is from Martin Sanders. Uh, many of you will know Martin. He's a personal friend and a colleague. Um, he has vast experience of uh, cultural organizations, now mainly at board level, in different countries. And I have to say, has been one of the most innovative cultural managers in the Netherlands. Uh, so when he asks this question, we know it comes from that kind of background. Uh, here's the question. Uh, there is a large public out there that is quite conservative. And actually, I know some of the organizations uh, he's referring to, and he's right. Their audiences really can be very conservative. Uh, they want things to really go back as quickly as possible to how they used to be. So how would you, Yasha and Leonard, deal with these very conservative core audiences uh, when you're proposing what seem like quite radical changes? Uh, do you want to start with this one, Yasha? Well, sure. I mean, it, I can only speak for, for my, from my experience level. So I, do, I, I personally... I just do believe, do believe a lot more in to deal with it when it's done, okay? I don't want to ask for permission. I want to 
really go ahead and I rather apologize. That has been my thing. I want to try and do it because when I built the museum, everybody was like, this is not a museum and we don't need a museum. And this museum is never going to be a museum and street art doesn't belong in the museum. And this will just not work. None of it, nor the residencies, none of it. I did it anyway. And the audience was so scared about a new idea of art in the street and, and trying to paint walls and like everything was scary, scary, scary. And the conservative audience, the people like leaders in other institutions as well as their audience were rejecting everything I did vehemently until we were opening, until it actually had come to pass and they had to deal with this. And they snuck around the corner and they looked at it and they started to see, oh, it's not all that bad. There is a new way of doing things. There is a new way of talking. I invited all the artists to talk with the press. I invited all the curators to talk with the museum's directors. I had people meet that never met before and I encouraged conversation, communication and exchange. And that's the bottom line, do it and get people to communicate with each other. If you really hate it, that is fine. Tell me you hate it. If you, you know, some exhibitions get the biggest, oh my God, I hate it, and the board's rejected, and the director has to resign. I'd rather resign or be fired, and in, but I will always try to bring a change across carefully, gently, not in your face with a sledgehammer, but there will be change, and you can't stop it. So your choice is yours you know, come with me on the journey or reject the journey. But then still, even if they reject the journey, if the journey is beautifully reported by others who took the journey, they'll come back. It's a matter of time and communication. Leonard. Yeah, I, I, I agree, especially with the end. So what I'm, I'm just going to give an example, which is not the cultural sector, but the way we actually do it with the startups that we start. Often when you have a great idea, you want to have the whole world accept that idea. The fact is that if it's something new, you have, uh, you have this uh, uh, adoption curve of new stuff. Uh, it's a bell curve. So you have your innovators, then your early adopters, early majority, late majority, and then you have the sleepy people. The interesting thing is what the curve doesn't tell you, that there's a big gap between the, um, the early adopters and the early majority. So what happens when you start something new, it's the innovators and the early majority that accept something that is not optimal. And what, your, what we tell you, the responsibility of a startup is, is when you want to scale, you actually have to find out what the difference is between the needs of the early majority, uh, um, uh, the early adapters and the early majority. And that's what you need to work on. That's one. And two, you have to select a target audience that's actually representative enough for the early majority to be convinced that, hey, this is something for me. So taking that to your, uh, the large public is conservative. It means if you have a great idea, as Jasha said, you should start. But if you're smart about it and business wise, you start with an audience that can influence a bigger audience that's open to change instead of trying to change the bigger audience right away. Yeah. And you see examples of um, how that works and then they become inspired that hey that's cool I would love to have that and then they accept the idea what's not going to work is just uh, uh, boot that idea to a conservative audience and think that they're going to change because then there's a lot of uh, uh, resistance and taking the example of how that for instance works is uh, uh, Tesla Tesla did not start with mainstream cars because mainstream people did not want to drive uh, uh, an electric car it didn't seem sensible so they started in their case with having a sports car for a certain um, uh, a certain target audience a target audience where mind you people thought no a sports car is the last thing that's going to happen electric but by choosing that uh, target audience it actually convinced other people in the early majority say hey i'm going to switch because it's actually an acceptable option but it's all about being very wise in choosing where to so you have to start i agree with you yasha but if you're smart about where you start you can actually influence uh, the rest i agree okay uh, 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 the, the next question that's uh, coming up uh, is i think a, a, a different way of looking at the same question really um, because there is a terrible danger um, of innovating for innovation's sake 
I mean, you know, changing stuff just because it's fun uh, and because flashy new things uh, with young people with interest in clothing must be better, surely, than uh, things that have been existing for a long time. There is a real danger of that. Um, and I think, uh, and that's why the next uh, seminar is called Let's Get Real. Because whatever changes people feel they need to make in their organizations, they have to be able to get from here to there. And they have to do so in a way that does not pull their organizations to pieces internally. And by extension, that drives away a lot of the people that really value what they've done for many years. So um, uh, just to be clear, that <laughs> we are not suggesting change for change's sake. Um, and the, the question I'm going to read out now really is a, is a different way of answering that question, but let's ask it anyway, because I think it will draw up different features. Um, uh, firstly, the, the, um, this is from Anna, or, or also a friend and business colleague. And Anna uh, is asking whether uh, actually, I mean, what you two are saying doesn't seem to be based on extensive research. Now, I have to say that's because I instructed you not to do that. Um, because this first seminar is about some key principles uh, and there is not time for either of you to present uh, a lot of research but uh, you may be able to point us after the seminar point us to research which underpins some of the things you're talking about particularly Yasha I know you're, you're studying this whole area now uh, and uh, Anna is asking well okay there is a danger here of throwing the baby out with the bathwater uh, so do either of you have concrete examples of uh, ways that change has been made uh, that has produced a good outcome and perhaps the opposite. Is there a way that change has been made which has been pretty disastrous and we should all avoid? Yasha, you said already you would like to answer this one. Yeah, I find that super, super interesting. Thank you for the question, Arne. Um, I would love to know why you appear, why this appears uh, not based on elaborate research. So the, I think the combination of what we have in 15 minutes discussed every single point in sections. I work in the sector of museum uh, content creation, city planning and curation for 25, now 26 years. I think what I've tried to do is base everything I do on extensive research. Usually what I use for this is a front end evaluation. If you want to be very academic. If I talk about a subject, I have focus groups. I deal with focus groups for a very length of time. Um, I ask questions in different gender, different age, all of this um, stuff. I do um, a lot of uh, uh, focus groups with, with um, you know, peers from other institutions and so on and so, so forth. But that's, it's all done. Let's assume we do our research um, and let's assume we're not talking out of our asses. Um, I, can say examples, it just depends on what examples you're looking for. I can tell you, for example, that Paul Spies, I invited him unknowingly, he's the curator in chief of the whole city of Berlin for five museums, and he comes from the Netherlands where he ran a beautiful museum in Amsterdam and changed that museum drastically. Now the chief curator of the Humboldt Forum. I didn't know him, I heard of him, I read a lot about him, I did my research and due diligence on him, and I invited him to come to my museum, which was globally rejected at first as a museum. And then all of a sudden, we did a good job. We educated, we did university classes. I'm a professor for pop culture and cultural crossover at the university in Mannheim. So all of a sudden it was legitimized what I did. He came to my house and he wrote the intro of my book. And my question to him was exactly that. Is there any change possible that is not just for, hey, there's something new, yay, it's innovative. He wrote a beautiful essay on that, which I'm happy to give to you, David, to pass on to anybody who's interested. Yeah, right. But that's how we got to know each other. And then he invited me to work at the Humboldt Forum. And that was extreme change for everyone. Not ever had there been street art or urban contemporary art in a big institution, in a conservative, in one of the most conservative institutions. And again, it was rejected, but we did it. And the change that we implemented there by mixing up traditional positions with new artists wasn't something new. It was just new in that particular space. Like you said, Leonard, it wasn't new, but it was new for that experience. And the change was enormous. To elaborate on the change will destroy the whole program, but I would be happy to provide some uh, idea. Yasha, that's great. And anything you care to share with us, we will pass on to all the participants. That's great. Thank you. 
Um, and Leonard, did you want to respond to that particular point? We have a, another question here, but carry on. Yeah. So I think, look, I'm not from the cultural sector, so I cannot give you all these examples from the cultural sector. What I can tell you is that all the innovation approaches, there's lots of research on it, and it's not only lean startup. You can look at Toyota. These are all best practices. What I do understand is that when we talk about innovation, everybody's talking about people in beanbags, sticky notes that I have in the back here. That's not innovation. Innovation needs a strategy. And part of that strategy is that you do not only innovate only for tomorrow. Um, um, and McKinsey and Deloitte, they have a very interesting model. It's called the Three Horizon model. And it just says you innovate 70% of your resources is in making what you're doing today better. 20% of your resources is on Horizon 2 projects, which is incremental innovation based on your business, but it's not very far away. You actually know that there could be a business model, but does it work for you? And then 10% of your resources is on, I don't know what's going to happen, blockchain in theaters, I don't know. The reason why you need to spread your resources is that at a certain point, what's science fiction actually becomes science fact. And when you've not researched that, enough, then you're not prepared to do that. So if you're talking about throwing the away the baby with the bathwater, what I see is companies investing heavily in all this science fiction type of innovation and not doing innovation on their core business, which actually then uh, kills their, um, their core business. And that's why it's so important to also make, do not make these these uh, humongous big innovation projects start small you know take your first start at all and then take your steps and have it grow and then and then horizon two innovation should first prove that it's good enough to be uh, invested in further so i uh, yeah so i i think there there is a lots of science and 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 uh, research on how that works and I think another great book to learn, uh, to read is The Innovator's Dilemma, because the different types of innovations, some of them you can actually do within a, your company. And what we are more specialized in is doing the innovations which you start and foster outside of your company, the little speedboats that actually can become uh, an oil tanker or become part of the oil tanker. Why do you want to do that? Because you don't want to hurt the, uh, well, the, the goose that's laying the eggs. Thank you. Um, and you said that was a book called The Innovator's Dilemma? Yeah, Clayton Christensen, he unfortunately uh, passed away not, uh, not so long ago, but he has very interesting examples. And it, it, it tells you two things. How do you separate that innovation and also think about the job to be done? And okay. If you would share that with us, then I'll pass that reference on to participants as well. Um, and uh, I have also a... There is, sorry to interrupt, if you, if, especially for people who are interested in the, in the, you know, cultural museum section, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with the Center, the Center for the Futures of Museums, as well as the magazine or like the, the article collection of Trends Watch. Uh, are you familiar with this? If you're familiar with it, that is a publication that helps enormously with research. Again, send the links to me, please. Uh, sure. and I'll make sure everybody has that after this seminar. Um, uh, we're, we're getting towards the time that we set for finishing, uh, so I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, Arne has uh, uh, posted a follow-up question, uh, which I'm going to tell you about, but I'd like to leave it for a future seminar. It's, it's a bit more detailed. Arne's asking about um, approaches to audience segmentation uh, and uh, the analysis, this analysis being part of the DNA for setting up highly individualist connections instead of abstraction. So this is really a question about really knowing your audience. Uh, and I, we could extend that to talking about research of different kinds. So you really understand your communities in general, uh, people who uh, find you valuable. Um, uh, that I think I'm going to leave for a future seminar. So not ignoring it at all. I'm making a note right now. Um, I wanted to just add a couple of points about the question we've been having about innovation, what it's for, why we do it, uh, and then see if there are any final questions before we wrap up. Um, the first thing to say is that, again, to repeat that every cultural organization is different, even if they look similar from the outside, which means that the way uh, cultural organizations uh, respond to the current situation, the way cultural organizations decide to innovate will be different. 
So the intention today is not to suggest a formula, uh, but to suggest really mindsets and techniques for thinking about your situation, your future, your purpose, uh, before moving on to much more practical things about business planning, data analysis, and so on and so forth. Um, there is a reason why uh, I invited people who are experts in change to participate in these seminars. And frankly, nobody at all has been invited to speak who has a huge experience of running cultural organizations in the Netherlands, with one exception, which we'll come to in seminar six. And that is because change is now forced upon us. It is not that we suddenly decided uh, in February that, okay, now is the time has come to change. We must change, we have no choice. There's a great English expression I'm sure you all know, which is that necessity is the mother of invention. And my goodness me, we have necessity and we better get inventing. Uh, one uh, additional point, which goes back to Martin's original question about conservative audiences, and I can also add conservative managers, board members, uh, team members in any organization, is that change is not linear. It changes rarely linear. Change we think of as something that happens slowly. There's a change, it gets a bit more, it gets a bit more. A little while later, after quite a smooth progress, 10 years later, five years later, 20 years later, we realize that actually we've come quite a long way and that was quite a smooth process. Change is rarely like that. Change is usually disruptive and happens very fast. A few, and it's, it's to do with the innovator model, the early adopter model that Leonard referred to, but actually you can think of, well, Tesla is actually a very good example. iPods are a very good example. There are many good examples where something which was science fiction, a few people trying it out, and then the next day, everybody has it uh, because change is not usually linear. We've reached one of those moments in the cultural sector everywhere and certainly in the Netherlands. So Can we have- Can I say something to this change. really quickly? Yes, sir, please. Because it's so important. Street art is change. Street art is urban contemporary and street art is change. It's the biggest change of the art world in the 21st century because it is so influential and it took something so holy out into the street and made it accessible for everyone. At first it was graffiti, little bits and pieces here and there. Now the Louvre uses a street artist to celebrate his 30th anniversary and covered with JR the whole pyramid, which is beautiful, knowing it'll cost them less to do this with a street artist and it has more reach than any $150,000 campaign. Street artist change, that's probably one of the biggest change to the cultural sector, the democratization of art. Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, wanting to see if there are any further questions that we haven't addressed um, before we begin to wrap up. Anything else? Post it now. Um, and of course, you will have more opportunity to ask questions in future seminars. Um, Yasha, Leonard, anything you want to finish with? Well, I, I, I think what, I'm, uh, what, what I would like to finish with is really be really focus yourself on trying to understand what your personal or problem of your business or institution is and really be inspired on how that problem is solved somewhere else. And I think what's the, the, the ability of an artist to, to, is to take that into an extreme, that then from that extreme, you can actually find a solution. And I have a very, very short, um, uh, I will share a link to that as well. There's something called the Odom device. Uh, this is something invented by a mechanic who loves to drink wine. It is actually a device which helps you bring children into the world when they are placed uh, differently. You look very confused. That's the whole purpose of this. This man actually used a technique of getting a cork which was shot into a bottle and actually applied it to giving birth to children. He understood the problem of having a delicate vessel in a delicate, uh, a, a, a delicate container, and I want to get that out without both the container and the vessel breaking. So it's really about not trying to come up with these really creative, elaborate solutions. Understand the problem, find a solution that actually solves that problem in totally different area, and then be creative on how am I going to do that? Because then, you actually have the evidence that it works and you only need to prove that it works within uh, your business. And I think a lot of the challenges the cultural sector have are challenges that have been solved somewhere else. Yeah, so you're waving your pen again. Oh, oh no, this is just such the worst habit on the planet. 
That's the worst habit ever. Well, it means like um, you want to ask a question. Can, uh, no, it's like this. No, no, no. Um, um, my, I can only say for myself that um, I go with creativity over everything. To me, creativity over everything is the most important guideline that I follow with, but I do not think that we can confine creativity to the artist. I think I go with voice. I think everybody is an artist, and I think board members have to be artists. I think directors have to be artists. I think everybody has to have the chance of creativity within their realm. There's very little creativity on the top of museums. I think we need to help enable the people that are supposed to lead uh, institutions or lead any you know museums or art movements to be able to be creative we have to enable them and that's why we hi have to get involved and either impose or change uh, definitions that I come we have to give the ability to be creative to everyone in the creative sector thanks for that um, okay there are no more questions um, and I think we're very neatly coming towards the end of our time today. Um, I want to, I mean, the, the, I, 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 uh, Leonard, I would like you please also to share some reference to the, did you say the ODOM method? ODOM, yeah. it's, uh, I'll share some links. Uh, please share some links. I'd never heard of it. It sounds fascinating, useful, and I wish I'd known about this when my wife was having our two children. Maybe that would have been helpful. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I, I can use it in the future in opening bottles of wine, surely. Yeah, yeah there we go. So uh, on a less important note. Um, that's a very, very, very practical point. Um, and uh, this leads me neatly into talking about our next seminar, because it's all very well talking in general terms about how we uh, are creative, how we think about our organizations, how we look from outside in, how we engage uh, processes uh, that have been developed, the use of research in, uh, identifying innovation we need to make but at some point we have to turn this into reality and indeed if you look at the series of six seminars we are indeed coming down from the rarefied aspects of uh, identifying our DNA and finding ways of uh, making necessary changes becoming ever more practical uh, the question of data uh, which Anna raised I have made a note of and we'll bring that into one of the future seminars very specifically the next seminar is called let's get real uh, and that's on October the 7th, also two o'clock, also one and a half hours. And the questions we're looking at there is how can we turn our dreams, our plans, our innovative ideas into reality? How can we make changes in our organizations without pulling ourselves to pieces? Sounds like Odon will have something to say about that. And also who really loves and needs us? That is an engagement question again and value question again. The two speakers are Kate Rolfe, um, her biography is, is to be found on our websites. We have a page about the seminars. Just look at the FSI website. Um, and Lea Stultraga, an American living and operating in Berlin. Uh, so Berlin and uh, the United States come up again. Um, so please uh, join us there. Um, and if you have enjoyed this session, uh, which was very cheap financially, just trying to cover a few costs, and also not that long in terms of time engagement, then Please, I encourage all participants to encourage other people also to join us. We will share with everybody some of the references that uh, Yasha and Leonard have, uh, have made. Uh, and otherwise, I think with two minutes to spare, I'm going to say thank you very much indeed to both Leonard and Yasha, uh, because you've delivered exactly what I asked you to deliver. And I hope something which has been a great interest to everybody participating. Uh, so thank you again, and we'll be in touch. I uh, want to find out from you and also from participants how it has been, uh, because I want to learn lessons from today to make the future seminars even better from everybody's perspective. But I'm actually going to stop now with one minute to spare. Uh, nobody gets refunds for that one minute. Everybody can contact me with any more questions through at Yasha Young Projects on Instagram. If you want to continue this conversation, just send me a DM. And thank you so much. Thank you both. Same goes for me. You, you, you can find me everywhere. So. Thank you, Leonard. Thank and you. Thank you for the participants as well for joining us. That was uh, it was wonderful to see you. Bye bye. bye.